moving from the this guerrilla group to this new capitalism society capitalist society so i stayed there for one month and i will share with you uh, I, I had to do something like, okay, I have to maybe think about a paper that I can write so I can go back and tell my supervisor, oh, I was in Colombia, actually. So I, yeah, so I was talking and interviewing people and asking, do, are you interested in writing papers now that you are uh, trans in this transition moment of leaving the guerrilla? And I found some people interested, so we wrote a paper. Um, so this is, I, I will try to tell the story a little bit. So uh, before I talk, all the images on this slide are in public domain. So it's all an illustration, so you have an idea of what happened. And what I wrote in the paper is about the, um, um, the use of technology, how it how it played in their own organi organization as FARC, and uh, how they coped with the te technology used against them. So we developed the concept of counter appropriation, where te uh, to explain technologically uh, an asymmetrical conflict, where one side of the the um, one side is forced to adapt the use of technology while the other side is using uh, advanced technology. I'll explain better. But I have to go back to 1948, when Jorge Gaetan, a social leader, was killed. And he was a um, candidate in the presidential elections. And he, he, was, uh, he defended uh, rural and work, workers' rights. And after he, he, he was killed, uh, there was a time called La Violencia, and it was 10 years civil war where 200,000 people was, were killed in Colombia. And in this moment of mass in Colombia, uh, some small farmers organized themselves uh, to, to, to defend the ownership of their lands uh, against the private settlers. And amongst that group, there was two people that decided to create this movement, that is the FARC. So from that, uh, after that, like this group was like a target from the, the, the armed, how can I say, the, the Colombian army and the right wing uh, paramilitary groups. And FARC found protection in very re remote areas. So they went to the jungle, to the mountains, and they are trying to hide themselves and at the same time try to find areas where they could use the land and protect the land. And also, I'm not saying that they were not also violent, uh, but at the beginning that's what were they were trying to do, protect lands and... And so, so you have an idea of min people, how many people were killed in, in, in that period some, period, some years after. So just 20% were guerrillas or from the army or the right wing paramilitaries. And from 2000 to 2015, more than 6 million were victims from different kinds of violence. So, end of 2016 was the, the signature of the peace agreement, and they delivered their weapons to the UN missions, and they began the reincorporation process. And this is the one that I went, it's in the Amazon rainforest. And it's a place where it's not so close to the city, so the government cannot, doesn't have to be worried that if they're gonna invade the city, and it's not so far so they can also connect the city if they want. So it's two hours by car in a very difficult road. And yeah, they live by themselves in this area. 200, uh, 400 people. Um, so this is the design summit that I went. 
and this is the camp. So they have uh, this is the, the the best camp that they have. Other the others one are just made of plastic or people camping. Uh, so this is they have houses and they have shared bathrooms. Um, this is the other, the other area. They are the other camp. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So they they divided the the in two, 26 camps. So they they are called ETCRs. That is, I forgot. It's here. Territorial space for training and recooperation. So they have 26 of them in Colombia, and now they are trying to to integrate into 13 to make it smaller because people are. All the ex-combatants are moving to the cities, so they are now they can have families, so they are willing to go back to their families too. To this, yeah. Um, so, for us, for me, and, and uh, talking to them and understanding how would they communicate themselves in this, <laughs> like all these circles that. Uh, where FARC was located. So how would they communicate at uh, that time, at the beginning? So I met a woman, and her name, is, it's not her name, but I used the name Laura. Uh, I asked her, how was the progress throughout the history to use the telecommunication, or how, how was it to communicate? And she told me that uh, before she um, joined uh, FARC, like when she was 14 years old, her dad was in jail for one year because he was helping to deliver food to FARC. And, and he was tortured. And when he came back, she, she decided, OK, I'm going to join FARC. I want to help them. And, but her brother decided, I'm going to go to the army. <laughs> I want to end this violence. So um, she went to FARC, his bro her brother, to the army, and in this process, she went to when she was 16, and she said that she at the beginning was a nurse, and then they gave her a role of being responsible for the telecommunication. That at that time, she would have to write to get papers, and send walk and go to the place with the paper to deliver it to the other place. So she said that she would take from one week to one month just reaching the other camp, the other place, the other, the other unit. And she, she said that all her learnings w while she was nurse, before going to the radio or to the communication, was through trial and error. And then I asked, so you had a paper. And how was the paper written? And she said, oh, I don't know what was written. I know there was many numbers. And I said, but each number meant, w meant what? And she said, letters. And when I was talking to another guy, I said, so what was the meaning of the, the, the numbers? And he said, each number was a word. So then they don't know. It was just the people that I talked, they, they were just the guys that would do the, the trans transmission of data. But they, were not, they didn't know what was written. <coughs> Uh, by 1998, she said that FARC grew in size, and then transporting pieces of paper was impossible. So they had they up updated uh, to the strategy. So they had uh, shortwave radios, and she had now to read the numbers out. Uh, and then, but she also didn't know the meaning of each number. But she knew that she didn't. It was uh, it was bad for for the for FARC if she would repeat numbers. So if people said something, repeat, she would, oh, I know I cannot repeat. So it was a bit complicated for her, she said. The process of saying it and being clear and, uh, yeah. She said also that she had to learn how to deploy the, the, the base to transmit every day at the same time in a different spot. So she had a, a compass and she would know which direction deploy by herself. No one could know because she was the woman. And the other person would do the same in the other unit. And they would, at the same time, communicate. And all this worry was to, so the, the army would not locate to find her 
in the location. So she would every time she would try to find another spot to deploy the antenna and uh, and transmit the, the 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 information that she has. Because it's the if you if you <laughs> yeah for the encryption she <laughs> yeah it was encrypted but if you repeat it seems that something it's r I don't I if you repeat the same word in different message yes but if you don't hear you just repeat it I don't see the point no repeating a number means that that's important so you can say if a certain maybe something is repeated a number of times. Uh, she did it. <laughs> we try to understand this. I'll finish. Uh, a few years later, the the computers were introduced, and uh, and uh, so messages now were broadcasted still via radio, but now she would type. And she said, now I could talk to people and I, I could say things that before she, would, she was not allowed by voice because she had a computer and she said she had a, an a, a app that came from the United States, she said, and she, it was encrypted. And I asked, what's the name of this app? What is, and she said, I have no idea. And I would ask, and, and, how, and how, which computer were you using? I don't know. And what, what were th the other things you would have? She said, a modem. And I said, okay, what is the modem for? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> but she, had, she knew how to do it. She knew how to de deploy. She had knew everything. She would tell me how, was, how it worked, but she didn't have an idea of what was, what was that for. I don't know. I know that I had a modem. I know that I had to put the antenna. I had to put in this direction, but I do not know how it works. Uh, it was interesting to see that they would pass knowledge th to other people uh, in a very limited way, without knowing very deeply the what was working and how how it worked. Um, <coughs> in 2000, there was an involvement from the, uh, the United States uh, came through Plan Colombia and almost $10 billion were uh, provided and 71% went to security forces. So the Colombia army now um, had access to highly advanced technology that enabled to conduct high precision bombings on FARC. Uh, FARC believed that the target bombings were enabled by small localization devices, which they called microchips. And they said that the, the microchips were placed uh, secretly in their supplies. So um, when I tried to understand what was these microchips, I was interviewing people and asking, how was it? And they said, oh, it was very small. And I, how is it? Uh, it was shiny. But could you touch? Uh, yeah, it would come in my clothes, uh, like attached to my clothes. So. I'm not so I'm not so sure if this microchip were something that existed, or if it was something that they, as a pro I don't know, they they thought that they had microchips and they were there was a surveillance in their community, so they started to electroshock the clothes. Mm -hmm. They would puncture the soles of the shoes with hot metals mm -hmm. to destroy anything that they that they would. Uh, find. There was another uh, way of putting all the equipments that would come, new supplies, food. They would put in, a, in the jungle far for one month and wait to see if it would bomb. So if it w nothing happened, okay, it's safe. Bring the, the supplies. Let's elect electroshock. Trrr, all the foods were electroshocked. And, and then they, they felt um, okay of using the products and supplies. There is um, a story that Laura told me, and she said, this is Rohoy, Mono Rohoy. He was the, the guy that she, she took care of him when she was nurse. And Rohoy had problems with his legs, so he needed special boots, 
we assumed that the boots, which had to be produced specifically for him in Bogota, contained a microchip. At the moment of his death, he was inside a, a larger camp with many fighters around him. The bomb targeted him directly. It is hard to believe that this was an accident. So um, they, she said that besides the microchip, they would have also the army would have cameras that would surveil, so surveil them to detect people. So if they would move, they said there was they would uh, they knew there was some uh, sensors, goniometers to detect s signals of their radios or cell phones, and and they think that they think no they had. Uh, airplanes that would be just there, like very quiet, trying to detect where they were, to detect the heat emitted by the body and when they were cooking. So they changed the they behave in the forest. They also had to sleep far from each other, and they were not using more flashlights. They would have ho ropes, so they would walk if they want to go check something. Uh, they were cooking on the, they would make a hole to cook inside to not have the heat uh, detected. And these were all the methods that they used. Um, at the same time that they had to, to fight against the army, they also had to have time to, to learn and to share their knowledge. So it was very important to encourage the reading and, and sharing and having classes during the days. Uh, I met some people that they were 24 years old and they would say, I've been here for 10 years. And I was like, wow. And he, they, th there was two or three people that told me that the reason they joined FARC was because uh, there was no school available. And so they had the manual of FARC. So I think it was a strategy of FARC of distributing their manual. So kids would start reading, like they don't have books, but they think they had this manual. So he said he was interested when he was 14, he decided to join FARC, so he would learn more. <coughs> so for me, it's remarkable like how much they were able to figure out about te technology used against them without knowing so much. Um, and for them, it was not so crucial to know how it worked they would like just to end the, the microchips or the detection that the army was trying to, to, to use. <coughs> so this is one of the towers that, they <coughs> that was deployed by the government, saying that they were bringing development to the place to, to give like cell phones coverage, but they were just bombing. The FARC was destroying because w the leader said, I would like to have a Faraday cage. I don't know if you know where you do not have anything going out or going in. So they were destroying all the towers. <coughs> and so, so just before I end, I just, I think it's important to thank the the f the ex combatants that welcomed me during the the two times that I went there, and I think it's also good to spa state that um, the neighboring Venezuela is in meltdown right now still, and more than one million migrants have crossed the border. So the transition period for ex combatants to become civilians is ending soon. So some demobilized guerrilla are losing confidence in the peace process. And since the peace agreement, more than 90 members of FARC and more than 400 social leaders and human rights activists have been killed. One of the persons that I interviewed was killed two months later. And the leader that was one of the authors, he, uh, when, I, when I left the camp, he gave me a ride, and that was the last time that people saw him. So he he's now back to, to the jungle. He's a dissident. And now he has two options, either be ki being killed or he's going to be sent to Guantanamo. So this is the situation that people are facing this. They have to go back to this civil society, like living in the cities. 
yeah, that's it. Do you? Uh, we can we can stop if you want. Yeah, I think he wants to stop, right? It's because I don't want. I think he doesn't want to to speak if it's recording. It's okay. Just muting. Actually, yeah, actually, it's, uh, I think it's very long. Can, can, can we resume the stream? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, I think it's very long. Maybe I'll uh, touch you for lunch. Yes. Okay. I have a lot of questions, actually. More questions? Yeah. So because he disappeared after we we ha we planned the paper, I couldn't put his name because I didn't have his permission. But uh, I collected so a lot of data, and he appeared again. So for the next paper, he's going to be author. Um, 
writing with him, it's it's uh, it's interesting to have uh, so much knowledge in, in one person that spent 26 years of his life uh, somewhere else. Um, so it's uh, the name of the the paper. It's um, it's a very long uh, paper <laughs> <laughs> name, but it's a guerrilla Colombia conflict. It's a HCI a human computer interaction. I can send it to you. Yeah. Because I think you have to pay if you are not. I'll send it to you. Some other questions? I, I have some pictures that I, I, if you like, this is the camp with colors. Uh, I also try to talk to them about building or deploying um, a, a mesh network. They were interested because they have a lot of knowledge and they would know how to build and they know how to make, to install, deploy radio. But nowadays they are just like, no, we just want to pay someone to come here and install. So they have radios, they have surveillance, they have cameras. <laughs> and this is, uh, they have one, a hill. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do they choose technology, what to use, what not to use? And nowadays or uh, before? Yeah, before nowadays. Uh. They had to trust what people would bring to them. Like they trust the person and they, they, they trusted. There was no, I, I didn't go so deep into who, who was bringing it. I thought he would tell me. Is it connected to Cuba, to Russia, and who are the people behind? And they would not tell me. Maybe they didn't know, but maybe I think it's something that I I didn't go too deep. Uh, it was rather what if they had a process to do that, like evaluate something, uh, like the pros, the cons of the technology. For instance, radio communication uh, it gives you like. Uh, you can better transmit message, but you can be localized and things like that. Yeah, they uh, understood very well about the localization and how the airplanes would do the tri triangulation. The, this, uh, they knew everything, like this part they would know. But uh, I think what they received is what they, they got. So it was not like, let's test this and see if it works because it would come and be distributed to many units. Oh. They have like around 20, almost 30 units. Okay. And they, so they see which units survive, basically, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, but I think it's, they would bring this technology from Bogota and just distribute in the many units and, and try, yeah, and try and see what's happening. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Very much. Yeah. Thank you.